Thank you very much, folk. Um, we might uh, open some scriptures, so if you've got your Bible there, let's uh, open up and have a look at a few thoughts. I might be getting older, but I could barely hear poor Rachel then. Just out of curiosity, could anyone, did anyone else have a little bit of difficulty hearing Rachel then? All the old people. <laughs> With me, quite clearly, with me. All right, okay. Be good to just perhaps turn it up a little bit, guys, if you don't mind, for those cases. Let's open up to um, a, uh, a story in the Old Testament, which I want to use today. But before we do that, I want to read Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. Not all of it, but a little thought or two here. Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11 is that, that chapter that's got all the information about how to get the Holy Spirit. You might recall that back in verse 13. If you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? And it's all about asking and seeking and knocking and asking and seeking and keeping on knocking until you get it. I think many of us re recall that particular passage there. But I want to just uh, launch into something a little bit different here. And take you down to verse 31. The Queen of the South shall rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. Now you'll see there that that's Jesus speaking, of course, and uh, he's describing the great judgment at the end of the age. And I'm not going to speak a lot about that particularly today, but he's describing the great judgment when it says that everybody will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. It says all shall give account of what they've said and what they've done. The Bible, in fact, Jesus himself said in another place that every man shall give account for every idle word that he said. Ouch. Every idle word. Wow. We're all in trouble, aren't we? And of course, that's a, that's a strong theme there. You know, uh, quite often in life, we, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, while the boss is not looking, you know, we might be a bit naughty, we might get away with a few things. I mean, I'm not saying I do that or that you do that, but uh, I certainly have a, a very vivid memory of when I was a young fellow many years ago. I was just a teenager. I worked in a drive-in theatre. Who remembers what drive-in theatres were? Yeah, a few of us here. And I worked in a drive-in theatre in the, uh, the cafe. And uh, quite often, uh, my mate and I would sit out in the back room and we'd sit there with, with boxes of polywaffles. Now, theoretically, you're allowed to eat stuff on the property, you just weren't allowed to take it off. But I don't think he had in mind that we could actually eat an entire box of polywaffles. I don't think that's what he quite had in mind. But we could actually do that. We could achieve that. It was, it was an event. Uh, we felt sick as dogs afterwards, but we could. And it's funny, right through life, of course, you, uh, uh, human nature is to, is to think, well, what can I get away with? The boss is not watching, you know? I mean, there are those shows on TV, you know, the, where they, uh, they take the secret videos. I'm trying to think which ones there are now, but there are a couple of them, I think. They take the secret videos and the employees are, are suddenly sprung and it's on video and uh, the things you'd, you wouldn't do if you knew the video camera was rolling, right? And how embarrassing it is. There's a, a lovely verse in the Bible that says that, um, uh, I'm trying to think of how it goes now, but it describes how, a bread of deceit, afterwards your stomach will be filled with gravel. You know, uh, if you're a bit tricky up the front, uh, it's going to feel like you just ate a whole bunch of gravel later. And that is the theme of the great judgment, because at the end of the day, uh, we live our lives presuming there's no judgment or behaving generally as if there's no judgment. According to Scripture, though, there is. Every individual will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That's what's going to happen. It says all will be judged. There's all this information in the Bible about how he's going to do it. 
It says the books will be opened and they shall be judged out of the books according to their works and so on and so on. And it says those whose names are in the book of life will be raised up, and we know that story, of course. Those not in the books of life will be cast into the lake that burneth with fire and brimstone. You know, we don't do a lot of fire and brimstone stuff here, but there we go. It's in the Bible, book of Revelation. And here Jesus says, now there's some people going to get to the judgment and you'll think, oh, they're villains, aren't they? You know, but actually, they're going to get off. And he uses two illustrations here. He says the Ninevites repented at the preaching of Jonah. Now, that's an interesting story. Go back and read the book of Jonah yourself. It's only four chapters. You can read it in about 15 minutes. And, of course, he's saying that the Ninevites are going to, in that sense, be more vindicated at the end of the age. Whereas others would have presumed that Ninevites would not be. Uh, they were very, very vicious, angry, uh, aggressive military country, the Assyrians. And uh, most people sort of hearing Jesus say that would be surprised. You know, they'd be very shocked to hear that the Ninevites are getting some sort of free pass. But he says also, he uses this other illustration. It's the one I want to focus on today. Verse 31, the queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. In other words, Jesus is pointing out that, that I'm, I'm actually greater than Solomon. You know, Solomon was just a man with his foibles and faults. Uh, I'm the son of God on earth. He didn't say that here, but you know the gist of it. And he says, uh, she was... Uh, most attentive to the wisdom of Solomon, but none of you are listening to what the Son of God is telling you. And he's trying to make this comparison here. Uh, who remembers who this Queen of the South was? Do you remember what her name was? Someone just said it over there, Queen of Sheba. Someone over there said Queen of Sheba. Yes, you're right. Uh, a free Mars bar for both of you. Go buy yourself a Mars bar after the meeting. Now, <clears throat> this is an interesting story because back in Old Testament times, and even at the time of Jesus Christ, most Israelites and most Jews and what have you, and there's actually a difference, but I won't talk about that today. Most Israelites and the Jews there, they would have automatically presumed because she was a foreigner that she would be despised by God. She'd be looked down upon by God because uh, she's from Sheba of all places. I mean, that's, that's the Arabs way down south of Israel there. Uh, she's from Sheba. I mean, queen or no queen, she's, she's pretty much a nobody so far as God's concerned. And yet according to Jesus Christ here, the queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. And so this reference here reminds us that there's something quite um, unique about this story of the Queen of Sheba meeting King Solomon. Uh, and I want to just turn back to it today in Luke, in, sorry, in 1 Kings chapter 6 and just look at the story a little bit. 1 Kings chapter 6. We kind of need to read a little bit of material around it firstly. It's, it's actually chapter 10. I'll read you the first few verses just to give you the introduction. Sorry, I beg your pardon. Chapter 10, verse 1. And when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to prove him with hard questions. I'll come back to that in just a moment or so, but Solomon has uh, uh, steadily built up a kingdom which is unparalleled in its time. Uh, people often don't realise, but his, uh, his empire extended from right up in modern-day Iraq down through to almost Egypt. It was quite a large empire, including slabs of uh, what we know today as the Arabian Peninsula and so forth. Uh, he also had uh, various um, treaties with countries nearby, and as a consequence, uh, Israel uh, simply went ahead in leaps and bounds. And it was all based upon the fact that as King David's son, the successor, he had asked God for wisdom from God. He'd asked God to give him understanding. And God had done exactly that. And so Solomon had uh, enjoyed the benefit of all of God's 
understanding and wisdom because as God filled him with that, it just seemed to change the course of his life. And amongst all the things that he achieved, and I'm going to read one or two of them just to get into it before we actually read about Sheba. But let's go back to chapter 6 for a moment because I want to just read firstly, as you see at the top of your page there, the building of the temple. Chapter 6, the building of the temple. I won't read it all, it'll take too long, but you can read that later if you'd like to find out the details. But I'll pick up verse 14. So Solomon built the house and finished it. And he built the walls of the house within with boards of cedar, both the floor of the house and the walls of the ceiling. And he covered the inside with wood and covered the doors of the house with planks of fir. This is the temple. And he built 20 cubits on the sides of the house, both the floor ends and the walls with the boards of cedar. He even built them for it within, even for the oracle, even for the most holy place. Uh, and the house that is the temple before it was 40 cubits long and so on. And it gives the details of this uh, very grand temple that God, he has been asked by or instructed by God to build. And it's very grand, it's very good, very large, and it, it, it would look astonishing. Down a little bit to verse 20. And the oracle of the forepart was 20 cubits in length. A cubit is about half a metre, so 10 metres long, and 20 cubits in breadth, so 10 metres wide, and 20 cubits high, so 10 metres high. And he overlaid it with pure gold, and so he covered the altar, which was of cedar. Now, as he's built this thing, it's sort of built of rock and cedar and fir, but every time he finishes something, he overlays it with pure gold. He puts a gold covering over everything, every single thing. It's quite amazing. Uh, he goes on in verse uh, 21. So Solomon overlaid the house within with pure gold. He made a partition of chains of gold before the oracle and he overlaid it with gold. He made something of gold, then he overlaid it with gold. Go figure. But anyway, a little further down in verse uh, 22. And the whole house he overlaid with gold until he had finished all the house. Also the whole altar that was by the oracle he overlaid with gold. Verse 28. And he overlaid the cherubims with gold. And he carved all the walls of the house round about the carved figures of cherubims and palm trees and open flowers within and without. And for the floor of the house, he overlaid with gold within and without. And uh, so we see here that all of the carved work was also sub subsequently overlaid with gold. But the little bit that always strikes me when I read this is, and, he over and the floor of the house, he overlaid with gold. Now, is it just me that think that is just over the top, right? You've built everything else of gold. You know, it's kind of reminds me of one of those fancy billionaire's mansions, gold taps and gold faucets and so forth. But after he'd done the whole lot, he said, oh, stick some lino down, put some lino down. Look, cover that with gold as well. The entire building, including the floors, was gold. Now, I'm not saying gold is anything, but it's uh, hard to get. And it is certainly very valuable. Uh, yes, anyway. And of course, uh, he overlaid the floor with gold. And as I'm reading this, it just reminds me, who remembers that description of New Jerusalem when we meet the Lord in the air? And the streets were made of gold. Now, for you and I in the 21st century, we sort of think, well, our streets should be made of bitumen. You know, or if you're in a new suburb, perhaps a fancy corner or two, maybe paved bricks. But if you get out beyond the city limits, it's not far before you end up on streets made of dirt and they get graded. And along comes the council grader, maybe once every 12 months or two years or after winter or something or other, and they grade them all. And back in Bible days, there were no bitumen roads. These were dirt roads. And so for Bible people, the concept of a place where even the roads are gold is simply a description of heaven. And all the people said, when even your roads are gold. And in this case here, the temple also just seems to fit in with exactly the same principle. The floors were gold. Everything else was gold. As I say, I don't think God cares about gold or brass or tin, for that matter, but to help us get the impression of what he's describing here, he says, that's right, 
the floors were overlaid with gold. And all of a sudden, this uh, image starts to uh, bring up, uh, as I say, images of uh, the new Jerusalem, heavenly Jerusalem. And I want to go on for a moment or two, just, just by way of uh, in, in passing. Over the page in chapter 9, verse 26, I saw this and I thought, that's interesting. Chapter 9, verse 26. And King Solomon made a navy of ships in Ezion Geba, uh, which is at the top of the Red Sea there, uh, which is beside Eloth on the shore of the Red Sea in the land of Edom. And Hiram sent in the navy his servants, shipmen that had knowledge of the sea with the servants of Solomon. And they came to Ophir and they fetched from thence gold, 420 talents, and brought it to King Solomon. Uh, 420 talents, we don't use this measurement of weight anymore, but it, roughly it's about 16 tons of gold. That's what it is. A little further down in chapter 10 in verse 14, and I'll make a point or two in a moment, verse 14. Now, the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 600, three score, and six talents of gold. It's a slightly different measurement there, by the way. 666 talents of gold. And he's saying that, uh, well, verse 15, and beside that he had of the merchantmen, of the traffic, of the spice merchants, and all the kings of Arabia and the governors of the country. In other words, there was lots of business happening. Verse 27 tells us in the same chapter, and the king made silver to be in Jerusalem as stones, and cedars made he as the sycamore tree that is in the vale for abundance. In other words, he's saying here that uh, in Jerusalem, silver was just as worthless as rocks off the ground. It was almost worthless. How much gold does he bring in? 666 talents using this particular measure is an annual gold revenue of about 25 tonnes per year. I don't know. Who noticed Australia regained its position this week in gold production? Anyone notice that? Just me? Don't you people read the paper? Clearly not. Australia this week, we, we've just become the world's largest gold producer again. Uh, we just pipped China uh, and uh, we're back on top of the leaderboard, which is great. Um, I think we produce, is it 156 tonnes a year? Something like that, uh, which is a pretty decent amount of gold. But uh, whatever, according to the Bible here, Solomon was bringing in 25 tonnes a year. Now, what I'm just trying to point out is the the wealth in this kingdom, the, uh, the splendour that would have resulted from this. Think about it. The money that's coming in, 25 tonnes a year of gold. It describes tens of thousands of servants and slaves and workers and what have you. It describes an empire that sort of goes from right up at the Euphrates down to the river of Egypt and uh, describes an, an army which uh, pretty much never has to fight because they just are, you know, everything's in peace and they're just making serious money year after year after year. Uh, you know, when you talk about the gold mines of Solomon, the fabled gold mines of Solomon, it immediately conjures this image of an incredibly wealthy empire at the time. Why am I telling you this? Go to chapter 10 again. We'll go back to that story. Chapter 10 and uh, verse 1. And when the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord... She came to prove him with hard questions. And she came to Jerusalem with a very great train or a caravan with camels that bear spices and very much gold. <laughs> He's got plenty of gold, but she's bringing more. And precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. Uh, so the, uh, the Queen of Sheba here, presumably a well-educated woman and uh, uh, noble in her own right, comes to Jerusalem because this guy Solomon is just completely out of the box. He's unique in our age. So she comes to him to talk to him and to uh, uh, share notes and share thoughts and ask questions. Verse 3, and Solomon told her all her questions and there was which he told her not. And you can read elsewhere of the extent of Solomon's. And there came no, much, no such abundance of spices as these which the Queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. And the story goes on, of course. But I just want to, um, it's a little hard to grasp the reason for her, uh, why she's so impressed. So I'll read a couple of these verses from a modern translation. This is the NLT translation here for those that are interested. But <clears throat> in 1 Kings chapter 10, I'll pick it up again just for a moment, just uh, four, four verses or so. Verse 4, you can read it in your version. And when the Queen of Sheba had seen all Solomon's wisdom 
and the house that he built and the meat of his table and the sitting of his servants. Now that's exactly the same as what I just read you. Clearly I'm not reading the NLT. How do you do this? Ah, there we go. <laughs> My apologies. Where are the kids when you need them? Right. Read again, verse 4. When the Queen of Sheba realised how very wise Solomon was, and when she, when she saw the, the palace that he built, she was overwhelmed. She was also amazed at the food on his tables, the organisation of his officials, their splendid clothing, the cupbearers, and the burnt offerings that Solomon made at the temple of the Lord. And she exclaimed to the king, everything I heard in my country about your achievements and wisdom is true. I didn't believe what was said until I arrived here and saw it with my own eyes. In fact, I had not heard the half of it. Your wisdom and prosperity are far beyond what I was told. And uh, the story goes on. Now, my point of course is in reading this story that this is actually a type. This is a type of us, the foreigners, meeting the Lord in the air. This is a type of us meeting the King of kings and Lord of lords, the one who has all power and all wealth. In the New Testament, Jesus talked about how you're going to rule over all things. He said, you're going to sit with me in 12 thrones and rule. And in this passage here, as she might well be a foreigner, and I know there's some people that speculate that she's the foreigner mentioned in the book of Song of Solomon. That's the, the whole story. You know the love song, Song of Solomon? Young couples, have you sat and read it together? Oh, goodness me. I used to look dreamily into Leslie's eyes and read chapter five. You haven't done that. You haven't lived yet. Uh, and of course, it's a, a very kind of a overwhelming song of, uh, you know, expressing love and affection and warmth and what have you. And uh, it may well be that she is that woman mentioned in the book of Solomon. I don't know. But what I do know is she's clearly a foreigner, an outsider, who's come to see Solomon. And like you and me, we arrive at the king's palace. We arrive in heaven. We arrive in a place where the floors and the roads are made of gold, symbolically. And I love the way it describes here how in verse, uh, firstly, verse, so where was it? Verse four, uh, no, where was it? Verse, verse five, and the meat of his table and so on, and there was no more spirit in her. There was no more spirit in her. In other words, she was just completely uh, stunned by this. We just read in the NLT, she was overwhelmed when she saw this. The Amplified says she was breathless and overcome. Uh, the NEB says she was amazed at all she saw. And uh, this is the, what's going to happen when we rise up to meet the Lord in the air. We're going to rise up to a place where you're going to be amazed. You're going to be breathless. You're going to be overwhelmed. You're going to suddenly rise to a place where all of this stuff of planet Earth is gone. You've come from the desert, like the Queen of Sheba here, maybe a place where it wasn't too fruitful and you know pleasant in life, had to make our living the hard way and so forth, to a place of complete luxury, a palace for you and I forever. Jesus in the New Testament said uh, that he, we, we weren't to be troubled. He said, I have many mansions prepared for you. And I'm not particularly saying it's a physical mansion, but I get the message that he's trying to get across. There's a place prepared for us. And I guess what I love about this story too is the way in verse 7 it, it tells us here, how be it I believe not the words until I came and my eyes have seen it. It's really hard to believe what God has got organised for us until we get there and see it with our own eyes. That's how impressive it's going to be. He say, She says in verse 7 again, And behold, the half was not told me. While you're on planet Earth and subject to the limitations of this human body, and, you know, the two kilo brain you've got, the grey matter, you will never understand half of what God has got organised. It's out of this world. And all the people said. And maybe as we go through life, it's always important to reflect on, on what our future holds for us. 
Uh, you know, we, uh, we poor human beings, of course, we go through life and we, we have to deal with stuff and we, we live the life of Christians and so forth and we're not allowed to retaliate and all that sort of thing. And uh, sometimes in life you can be a bit, you know, oh, exhausted by the process. And the, maybe there are health issues, maybe there's finance issues, maybe there's job issues, maybe there's family issues that you face and so forth. And you come here for a bit of a break and all that Pastor Kevin does is remind you you've got issues when you go home again. Sorry about that. Maybe there are issues when you go home again. But the point, of course, is you've got a bigger reward at the end. You've got an amazing reward at the end. It's worth hanging on for. It's worth persevering for. As Jesus pointed out, uh, he that endures to the end shall be saved. There's a lot of people who give up really easily. There's a lovely verse in Proverbs that says, if thou faintest in the day of adversity, thy strength is not deep. If you, if you, if you throw the towel in when stuff starts to get a little bit hard, well, there's not a lot to you really, was there? You know, are you really suitable for the kingdom of God? We've got to persevere. We've got to dig in. We've got to hang on. Uh, so she points out here, the half has never been told me. Over into the book of uh, Corinthians, if you will, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, another verse that I love. One Corinthians chapter two, very uh, well-known passage, verse uh, nine. Well, actually, kind of start a bit earlier than that. Uh, the Corinthians, of course, is the church, the Christian church at Corinth, in what we—it's still, you know, a city today, Corinth, in the southern Greece there. And uh, uh, Paul has been there preaching, and he's got them saved and what have you. And he describes this particular uh, experience down in verse uh, uh, verse three. I was with you in weakness and in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Later in the book of Corinthians, Paul goes on to describe in chapter 12 and chapter 14, that in the Christian church, we can expect to experience speaking in other tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecy. He talks about gifts of healing, miracles, discernings of the spirit, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith, and so forth. And uh, all of those things are a package of, of miraculous things that happen because of we, we are Christians, thank God. Uh, so he describes here this, this, this fear he had when he first went to tell them about God in verse four. My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. And uh, whenever you preach the gospel, you've got to have that demonstration of God's spirit. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So the beginning of your experience with God was having all of these experiences associated with God's Holy Spirit and with his miraculous power. That's how you became Christians. Albeit we speak wisdom amongst them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught. And it's funny because he now starts to bring in a little thread that we sort of read about with Solomon, the man of enormous wisdom. And he reminds us here, he says, our wisdom is not earthly wisdom. You know, it's irrelevant how good you are at picking shares that are going to rise or perhaps, you know, deciding, uh, you know, which uh, political party to back or something or other. We're not interested in worldly wisdom. He's talking about the wisdom of God, the things that are associated with God. We speak the wisdom of God in verse 7 in a mystery even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of the world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. In other words, he says here, if, if, if the devil and his messengers understood how this all worked, nobody would have ever crucified Jesus because that would have ruined God's plan. Verse 9. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. And uh, Paul uh, quotes an Old Testament passage here where the, uh, the, the prophet tells us that uh, I hasn't seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. For those that truly love God, God has an amazing reward for you. Uh, it's beyond all comparison. 
It's like uh, in life, if you love somebody, well then, you know, things follow from that, don't they? I mean, if you, if you, if you, if you, if you love your dad, you give him a, a nice Father's Day present. All the dad said. Sounds a little sad, that one. Or perhaps if you, you, you love your family, you give them like nice Christmas presents. I mean, you don't, I don't think generally you walk into the neighbour three houses up and say, whoa, here's a lovely big Christmas present I brought you. Nope, doesn't quite make sense. Uh, if you, uh, you know, you're getting married perhaps, uh, you're, 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 you know, and you're in love, you know, that's, there's all sorts of things that sort of, uh, you know, result from that. You know, perhaps it's a planning a, a wedding or perhaps it's a planning a honeymoon or perhaps it's planning to, you know, buy a house or, or get into a flat or something or rather. All these things are part of it. And he says, well, guess what? If you love God, he really is the giver of really good presents. And he's got this amazing future lined up for you. He's going to raise you up. You're going to come out of your earthly bodies like a, a butterfly out of a cocoon. You're going to be made into a body which is indestructible and you're going to live forever and ever and ever with him. Uh, he's going to take away all sorrow and tears and the pain of this life. He's going to remove all the dramas of this life because in the next life, you're going to be a ruler. You're going to be like a king, a president or something or other. Uh, in the next life, you're going to be known by people as somebody that was resurrected during the great resurrection. Because as time goes by and people get older and die, because they'll still do that on earth in the next age, the Bible teaches us, you won't. You'll be like one of those, you know, movie characters that is just eternal. Uh, you'll be known, according to Jesus' words, the Son of God said, uh, you'll be known as one of the children of the resurrection. The Bible teaches us in another place that he that takes part in the first resurrection over him, the second death, has no power. You're going to go on forever and ever and ever with the Lord. Thank God. He tells us in another place, he proves that to us by giving us the Holy Spirit. It's the insurance, the, the inheritance uh, down posit deposit, as it were. In verse 9, as it is written, the eye has not seen, nor the ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. I like the way he explains there that God has actually prepared this for him. You know, you don't just suddenly get to Christmas Day. I mean, who, who on Christmas Day thinks, oh, I think I must go out and buy something for the kids? And at eight in the morning on Christmas Day, you decide to nick out down the shops and see if you can get something. Good luck with that. Not going to work. You know, you're buying the Christmas presents perhaps back in October or something or other. Sometimes. Or November, maybe early December or the later, surely. And of course, that's what the Lord's saying. I've prepared this for you. I've got it organised for you, this amazing future. I mean, don't get me wrong, we've enjoyed this life, what we've had of this life. It's great, you know, there are lots of good aspects of living in a human body on planet Earth. We know we're an amazing creation designed by God. We know that. But the next one is going to be out of this world. It says God's spirit and our spirit have joined together to make a new creature. It says we're going to be the first fruits of his next creation out of nicely we sing or whatever it happens to be, it's the fact that we do, we do what he said to do. That's the great test of love towards God. Um, but, verse 10, God has revealed them unto us by his spirit. And what happens as you walk along in the Lord, and I think it was Nick that said in his testimony, the little uh, pops of understanding that you experience from the Bible over the decades just uh, open up to you what is coming up next. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, we've tasted of the power to come. Uh, you've had a, a sample of it. And uh, the Spirit now shows you little glimpses of what comes up in the next age. The Bible also warns us in the same book of Corinthians here. In fact, we'll turn across to it, shall we? Chapter 12. Chapter 13, I'm sorry. Chapter 13. Paul discusses uh, things like speaking in tongues and prophecy and what have you, miracles and stuff like that in chapter 12 and 13 and 14. And one little statement he does make, though, in verse, uh, 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 verse 8, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail, and whether there be tongues, 
they shall cease, and whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. And Paul points out here, he says, these things that we currently enjoy, speaking in tongues and miracles and healings and knowledge and what have you, when Jesus comes back, when that which is perfect is come, when we see him face to face, when we know him like he knows us, all these things will be done away. They'll be like childish toys, miracles, healings, you know, walking on water. It'll be like a childish toy when you meet the Lord in the air. So amazing is that reward going to be. Uh, and he says here, and then at verse 12, for now we see through a glass darkly. Uh, to see through a glass darkly, it's a reference to um, being able to, it's like looking in a mirror, an old fashioned mirror that is not very clear, an obscure sort of a mirror. He says trying to see the future through this mirror is pretty hard to do. You can get glimpses of it, you can sort of see it, but you sort of can't as well. And he says, that's a bit what it feels like. It's a bit frustrating. Now, that's written by a bloke, by the way, who uh, we find in the book of 2 Corinthians was taken up into the third heaven and heard things which it's not possible to explain to you. Do you remember that? Who remembers that? In uh, 2 Corinthians there, Paul explains that he was taken up to the third heaven. He was taken to the millennium. And in the millennium, he saw everything as it was happening in the millennium, but he couldn't explain it to people back down here on earth in 65 AD. It was just beyond their comprehension. He said, I've experienced it myself. It's amazing, but I can't explain it to you. It's really hard to explain. Uh, and so he tells us here, we're still seeing through a glass darkly. We get a glimpse of it, but no matter how good you get, the half has never yet been told, <laughs> all the people said. Over to uh, another passage, if you will. How am I going? I'm running out of time. Okay. Matthew 19. Matthew 19. Just two little, uh, just two, two little words I want to focus on just for a moment here. Matthew 19, we read down in verse, uh, again, right at the end of the story here, verse 27. Verse 27. And then answered Peter and said to him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have there for? What's the prize? What's the reward? What do we get out of this? And Jesus said to them, Verily I say to you, that you which have followed me in the, in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And every one that has forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold, and shall receive, inherit everlasting life. And this story relates to the sense of uh, loss that Peter and the guys are feeling. He says, uh, we have forsaken all. We've forsaken all. What do we get out of this if we've forsaken all? What, what, what's the reward for that? What do you get if you forsake everything? And Jesus says, well, number one, you're going to get a hundred times more of what you lost down here on earth, if you've ended up losing brothers or sisters because of the gospel's sake, if you've ended up losing property or houses because of the gospel's sake, maybe you lost your job because of the gospel's sake, God will give you a hundred times better down here and in the age to come, eternal life. Because sometimes we can see these promises and we think, well, I feel, I feel like I've lost a whole bunch of stuff, you know. Uh, I mean, I know people over the decades who, uh, you know, <laughs> People who've been written out of wills. I remember, I won't go into cases, but people who, uh, you know, they got home. I remember one fellow, poor fellow, he got home after getting baptized and his children all abandoned him. He's grown up children. He was an older guy. And his children that day just said, That's it. We're having nothing more to do with you. You've been baptized at that crazy revival church. We want nothing more to do you from this day onwards. Others I've seen over the decades. <laughs> As I say, got written out of wills and all sorts of crazy stuff. Others got sacked 
because of what they stood for. Now, we, we get filled with the Holy Spirit and we're suddenly the nicest, kindest, gentlest, you know, most pleasant people on earth. But we sometimes suffer. And Paul is, Jesus is pointing out here, if you've forsaken all, you're going to inherit everlasting life. Uh, over again, if you will, another theme over in the book of Timothy, and I just quickly want to pick this one up too, 2 Timothy 2. So in life, you may feel like, oh, I've had to forsake a lot. I've left a lot behind. I was planning to become a soccer star. And I had to let that go. I was going to become a rock star. I was going to go on to, I had to be careful what I say now, the voice. Is that what, a reasonable one? And win the voice or something or other. Actually, trust me, I've heard most of you sing. You're not going to win. <laughs> You know, I had these plans for fame and fortune and uh, in the future, and they all seem to evaporate. I've forsaken it to follow God. That's okay. You're going to get everlasting life. Great is your reward in heaven. Second Timothy in chapter 2, and I, I'm just trying to keep this fairly short. Uh, verse, uh, verse 3, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. Endure hardness. Um, we saw a moment ago the, the sense of, 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 of loss, the sense of sort of forsaking things, leaving things behind. And here we see the, the sense of suffering, the sense of, you know, what you're going to have to go through, the dramas in life that you're going to have to put up with. And Paul says you've just got to toughen up like a soldier. A soldier doesn't choose where the battle is. He's just got to be there. He doesn't think, you know, it's very rare. I can't remember the last time that, you know, somebody invited soldiers to go and fight in Hawaii. Oh, actually, I can actually. No, think about it. Pearl Harbor. Uh, but we won't go. Yeah, we won't talk about the war. Uh, and, of course, you, very rarely you tend to sort of be fighting in jungles with mosquitoes and snakes or perhaps in deserts with no water or something or other or maybe in the middle of winter in Siberia or something or other. Uh, and Paul says, that's right, no man that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Uh, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Tough it out. Persevere. Don't be a, don't be a wuss. Don't be a cream puff. It doesn't say, and all the cream puffs got welcomed into heaven. To heaven. Uh, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. A little further down in the same passage, it tells us down in verse 8, Remember that Jesus Christ was of the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble, even as an evildoer, even under bonds or chains, being put in prison. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. And it is a faithful saying, if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. And so Paul points out, that's right, sometimes as we're waiting to inherit the throne, we're going to go through suffering. We're going to go through trials. We're going to go through tribulation. But we must persevere because if, we, if we're dead to ourselves on this earth, we're going to live with him. If we're suffering because of his namesake, then we're going to reign with him. We're going to rule with him. Over to the book of Revelation just for a moment. How am I going for time? Oh, I've kind of run out of time. Psalm 16. Skip Revelation. Psalm 16. We started off today talking about the, the illustration of the Queen of Sheba arriving at King Solomon's court and being overwhelmed with what she saw and experienced and the, the sense of majesty and power and wealth and how it reflects on us when we meet the Lord in the air. It's going to be the same over, sense of overwhelming. Uh, pick up a little theme now in Psalm 16, and it reminds us what it's like. Down in verse, uh, uh, verse 11, just one verse here. Thou wilt show me the path of life. Well, thank God I found the path of life. God showed it to me. I found how to live forever. Verse 11 again. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Uh, when we are with the Lord, as Jesus said, welcome into the joy of the Lord. All the stuff from this life will be gone. It'll be ancient history. 
dramas, issues, money, health, family, all that sort of stuff will be gone. And in its place, it'll be replaced by the joy of the Lord living forever. At thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Um, we, we don't know the details. And as I say, we can only visualize half of what it's telling us, but our reward is massive. Persevere. And all the people say, amen. I'm going to ask... Uh...